Okay, now we can move on to the next session. And it's my pleasure to introduce Fatima Crispi. Fatima is a gynecologist specialized in obstetrics, eh, so which is related to pregnancies and deliveries. And she's a researcher specialized in fetal cardiology pre predominantly, and she's also the scientific director of BC Natal, which is in Barcelona. You have a collaboration between Hospital C Clinic and Hospital San Juan de Deu, the pediatric hospital, where the obstetric departments are more or less joined, and the research is also joined going on. So that it covers like the whole fetal towards neonatal and pediatric uh, kind of research. So which we know by now that you shouldn't do like isolated things. And especially if Fatima is working on this and you will see is on predominantly on the impact of prenatal lives so of, of like the fetal conditions on the development of the fetus, but also later on, even in, in adult life. And one of the things also why I think Fatima is very important for our community is that she's one of the persons that really believes that engineers might be useful. And so in that sense, uh, we are collaborating already for a long time where you really see that, especially in this domain, and there's a lot going on, and especially when you look at subtle changes, and also like the previous speaker already said, it's like understanding physiology, mechanics, uh, then using data science, using simulations, and so on is very, very important in order to advance the field. So although Fatima is a clinician, her research is in such a way that she's very combined. And so that's why she's ideal for the summer school, where she can both give the clinical background, and she's also still actively, of course, doing clinical medicine. And so from the clinical experience, trying to see how data science, how understanding of, of the pathophysiology can help. Please, Fatima, thank you for being here. So good morning and, and thank you for all the people organizing this summer school for the invitation and particularly to Bart that thanks to him we have been collaborating for many years and now I think I couldn't live without engineering. And you will see from, I, will, I have tried to summarize mo, some of the things that we have been doing and, and you will see the strong impact that engineering uh, image analysis or that analysis has have and help us I, I, in our research. So very briefly, Bart already told you, BC uh, Natal, that I, I, I'm part of it. It's a joint from Hospital Clinic and San Juan de Deo in University of Barcelona. We are a large research center, about 100 people, trying to combine medicine with technology and, and biology. Yeah, so and then uh, we are focused on women's health. And when we talk about women's health, these are basic concepts. Eh? We have gynecology. Gynecology is to take care of non-pregnant women. So anything related to the health of women that are not pregnant. And then obstetrics that manage reproductive medicine, who is women who are not pregnant, but they are looking for, they, they are trying to get pregnant, or maternal fetal medicine, that it's when women, it's already pregnant. So I, of course, I will be focusing on this pregnancy part. Yeah, and then these are also basic concepts. If we talk about a pregnant woman, we have different phases. We have the embryo, that is the first part when there is few cells there. Then we go to a fetus, and then when the baby is born, we call it neonate or newborn. Yeah, and this is a, a long period of time, as I was saying. In embryo, we have like this small part, these small cells that are start building the individual, and then in fetal life, we have like a. It's not like a small uh, kit, it's really different entity, but it's this baby that is inside and then we call it neonate. And then re related to reproductive medicine, that's not my field of expertise, but I will briefly comment two things that I think that are relevant and if that you like this field, there is a, now a, a, a lot of things starting to be there and that really need from engineering. So fertility is a real problem nowadays mainly re because of aging and comorbidities, think that, think that the ideal age for women to get pregnant should be 20, 25 years, that's the ideal age. And now we have a mean age of 35 years of pregnancy, which is already 35 years the decline, starting the decline. So then, because we have this society that brings women getting 
older when they get pregnant and then when they are older, they have also comorbidities, less ovarian reserve, many problems. Then people get problems to get pregnant. And then it's where assisted reproductive technologies arise, that these are in vitro fertilization and all these types of techniques that try to help uh, people that cannot get pregnant to get this pregnancy. And then in this field, I just want to comment one thing that it's this, that's the, 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 this is an image of a human embryo, just starting from one cell and you see how these cells divide and, and this will create a baby. Yeah, so you start with one single cell from the oocyte and sperm, just getting together and you get up with a, a different embryo. Think that all this process, it's done in vitro. So you start from one cell and then it grows. In the past, this was done in a culture and they were putting that there and then Every two or three days, they were took it, taking out from the culture and then looking at the microscope and saying, okay, it's going well or not, I'm putting back now. Now we have the embryoscope, that it's a machine that gives you this real, every second image of this embryo. So that, that has been a major breakthrough in this uh, reproductive medicine because you can see the embryo all the time, so you can really see how it's going on. But as you can imagine, this um, generates huge amounts of data, because that, that's a short a, a video going fast, but usually this takes like 10 days that you have every second or every millisecond the image of the embryo, so that's called embryoscope time lapse. And then there is a lot of artificial intelligence or data taken there trying to see how to, to, to predict which embryo is going well, which not, try to diagnose things. So this has been a major advance in this field. Okay. And then if we move on to maternal fetal medicine, which is my area of expertise, um, we divide it by maternal medicine, which is mainly taking care of mothers and mothers that do have problems. For example, a pregnant woman that has uh, other diseases, cardiac disease or a cancer or thyroid disease or, or, or problems during pregnancy and how to manage that. And then there is the other part that it's fetal medicine, that it's taking care of a fetus like an entity. Fetal medicine tries to take the fetus as a patient, and this is a, 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 an, an area that is relatively new. Yeah? Think that actually now we call it fetal medicine, but in the past this was called obstetrics. Yeah, so you have maybe heard better, no? Gynecology and obstetrics. Obstetrics, it's a Greek word that says the ones who is waiting. Yeah, because an obstetrician was mainly waiting. So it was a doctor that was looking at the belly of the mother and then waiting there. And at some point the baby was born. But in the past, imagine 200 years ago, there was no scans. So uh, an obstetrician, a doctor was looking and then they, were, they didn't know if it was one or two babies, if it was a boy or a girl, they didn't know if it was a malformation or not, they knew nothing. And there is all books telling, okay, when you have a delivery, you have to wait if there is another one or let, let's see what happens, yeah? But then there was a, a fully change when ultrasound came. When ultrasound came and it was invented, we could start to see this patient, to see the fetus, because with the ultrasound, you can non-invasively look at this fetus and then the fetus emerged as a patient. And then it started to call it fetal medicine, because now we can see the fetus, we can diagnose problems in the fetus, and now we can do medicine in this fetus. In the past, we couldn't do anything. Yeah? So that's relatively new. Let's say that it's 50 years old. It, and there is, for that, many things that are new. And you will see that we have been working on, for the first time, looking at things, or for the first time, describing normalities, because in the past, that could not be done, because this patient didn't exist, or at least we could not see it. Yeah? And then from this part, there is a lot of super specialities that have emerged. I, I'm dedicated mainly in fetal cardiology, but there is, of course, the fetal brain, the fetal kidney, the fetal lungs, anything or fetal growth that can be related to that. Yeah, and then it's, it's a very short video just showing um, um, how the fetus is growing inside the belly of the mother. And I just wanted to put this video to realize that our patient is inside the uterus of the mother, inside the back, inside the uterus of the mother, inside the belly. So that means that the only way that we can know how our patient is, is by ultrasound. So then for us, the ultrasound is like the phonendoscope for cardiology. So without ultrasound, 
we are nothing. <laughs> we can look at the belly of the mother and we don't know what's going on. So we really need image, and that means that all maternal fetal medicine specialists, we really need to know and, I mean, no ultrasound because our ultrasound is our la la like part of our hand and we really need image and to know very well how to tune this ultrasound image to let them get images. Then um, image has changed a lot. So that's a picture of the 80s, that how an ultrasound was. And in this case, that was the placenta and that was the head, so it was a very primitive image. And you will see, because I will put now videos, how this image has changed, and now we can see many things. So for example, like uh, in, that's another more recent image that you can see the profile of the baby. So you have the baby, the nose, the profile, that's the spine, so you can see much, many things. And ultrasound machines, equipment, improve every year. Every year, the companies bring a new machine and you see more things and you see more details. And of course, that means that you can diagnose more things and you can better control your, your, uh, your patient. That's an image of, for example, a baby of five weeks of pregnancy. So it's just five millimeters baby, but you can already see. So that black thing, it's the, it's the amniotic sac. This is the head of the baby. This is the, yeah, so the body. So you can see already, it's a very, very small, but with the ultrasound, you can already see that. And then that's at 12 weeks. At 12 weeks, you have a baby that it's almost has anything, yeah? So you have the face here, you have the spine, the baby it's just jumping because they move a lot, yeah? You have the extremities here, the core blood. And of course, it, this baby was just 70 millimeters, so it's pretty small, but you can already see a lot of things and it's already fully developed. Yeah. Um, we can also assess fetal growth because we can measure several parts of the baby and estimate the growth. We can look at the blood flow using Doppler of the umbilical artery and see how the, the blood flow goes through the umbilical cord. We can look at the middle cerebral artery, that's a, an artery in the brain, and see how the blood flow is going to the brain. And we can look how the blood flow is arriving to the heart. So we can check the hemodynamics of the baby very well. This is an image of a fetal heart that is inside the belly, that these are the right ventricle, left ventricle, and the atria, so the four chambers of the heart, and the image is very good. So already in 2D, we can have very good images. In the, in the beginning of the 20s, there was a, a, a guy that's called Jagel. He defined it a five chamber view, a, a five, five views of the heart to standardize the measurement of the heart. And now all babies, before they are born, we do this checklist and we know if the heart is normal or not. The brain also has improved a lot. So if you remember the image I put it at the beginning that it was a ball with black inside, now we can see a lot of structures inside the brain with already ultrasound, neurosonography. Sometimes we do it transvaginally. There is some work being done with machine learning or deep learning trying to recognize all these structures automatically and to predict the outcome. And in the brain, it's also very important the feature brain MRI. Um, MRI has a, a, a lot of potential because it's non-invasive, so it has no radiation. You can do it in pregnancy, and it has a very good resolution. The problem with MRI is that you need your patient to be quiet, no? to acquire the image. And the problem is that the fetus usually it's not quiet. The fetus usually jumping. So there is a lot of groups working on trying to solve this movement problems because you cannot say the baby, okay, stop moving because it's not going to stop. And then for that reason, um, the organ that it's most mostly used or mostly uh, um, studied is the fetal brain because usually at the, mainly at the end of the pregnancy, babies usually put the head down on the pelvis of the mother before delivery and the head is there. And there it doesn't move that much, let's say, because babies usually are head down and they don't move that much, and then you can get reasonable images of the brain. And then we have been working here with Miguel Angel Ballester, doing all this post-processing, because it's very complex. Yeah, in neonate it's complex, but in fetus it's even more complex, but you can do very nice things, delineate, uh, get volumes, get information from that after a lot of post-processing. Yeah, it's not just straightforward. But that's something that we can do it. 
and of, um, we do some fetal brain MRI in some specific pathologies that we suspect anomalies on the brain in clinical scenario also. Okay, so that was an introduction about the area of maternal fetal medicine, and now I will try to show some of the things on research that we have been doing in fetal cardiology. Some, and you will see that many of them have engineers in the back or behind working or helping to get the data. So I will be trying to uh, say uh, how we have been up, um, approaching this issue of fetal cardiology. So the first part that we had to address is how to study the fetal heart. Because I was saying, okay, I want to, to be a fetal cardiologist, I want to study the fetal heart, but the first that we had to do it is how to study a fetal heart. Because I told you, 50 years ago, or 100 years ago, we didn't have ultrasound, so it didn't even exist. So many things we had to start validating or applying. So the, the many of the papers or research that we have been doing is to apply or validate new modalities for studying the fetal heart. So many of these things we are taking from adult cardiologists or pediatric cardiologists that they develop, for example, the tissue Doppler, that it's a modality of Doppler to assess the myocardium, but you cannot apply this technology for the adult cardiologists directly to the fetus because it doesn't fit, it's too big, it's not, it's not expected that it's moving, so it has a lot of particularities. The fetal heart is inside the uterus, it's going very fast, so if, for example, an adult heart goes uh, from usually 70 beats per minute, more or less. A normal fetal heart goes 140 beats per minute normally. So it goes very fast. It's inside the uterus of the mother. We don't have ECG. We cannot have electrocardiogram. And then it, the baby's moving all the time and the projections and views are very different. So it has a lot of difficulties to assess the fetal heart, but over time, and also working very uh, closely with mainly adult cardiologists from clinic and from other entities, and then with a lot of insights also from Bart, that he knows a lot of fetal physiology, fetal, uh, cardiac physiology and also cardiac imaging, we have been able to implement or to validate some of the tools that adult cardiologists are using also for the fetal heart. Another important part has been to define normality of fetal heart, because as I was telling you, this is a new specialty. So we didn't know what was the normal size of the area of the ventricle that it changes over time. Yeah, in this graph here, you see gestational age and how it changes. At the beginning, fetuses are very small and they are usually very similar. And then when they are growing over gestation, they spread and, and, the, uh, and variability arise. Yeah, but we had to work and do normality studies with a lot of pregnancies trying to understand what's the changes of a normal heart on the structure and also in the function. And this we have dedicated a lot of time and efforts there. And then also another thing was to describe patterns of fetal cardiac remodeling. Remodeling means when you have an insult and you have to adapt. So for example, when, uh, when the heart has a problem or an insult, usually the heart has different ways to adapt that are very well when known in adult cardiology. For example, if the heart needs to pump harder because there is a problem, the heart can produce more muscle. And have, if you have more muscle, you will pump harder and then you will hypertrophy. Or maybe you are going to dilate. So you have, we have been like recognizing different fetal problems, different entities, and recognizing different ways of adapting of the fetal heart, that it's not exactly the same as adult heart. And, and this has been also a lot of work over time. Um, I will show later some data for this. We have been working also with Bart and in computational models, and Patricia Garcia was doing the PhD on that, and she developed a, a computational model of the fetal circulation that has been very useful, and you will see later that has helped us to um, answer some questions or some problems that we didn't know. Yes, yeah, so computational models, I do believe that they are very useful, but the important thing is that to make a computational model useful, you need to have a very close collaboration with the clinician and the, and the engineer. So the clinician has to be able to transmit the question that I don't know how to answer, and the engineer has to be able to understand that question and make the computational model answer that, and then translate this information to the clinician, which is not 
easy or straightforward. And usually after working for a, a period of time, open-minded, you end up doing that. Yeah, we have been also working, uh, Patricia was working on developing a, a computational model also of the cardiomyocyte. Other tools that we have been using. So in experimental research, you have also animal models because, of course, in humans, you can look at the fetuses and we get most of the information from the ultrasound, from the echo. But ideally, you would like to have this heart, take it out and look it in the microscope. This, you cannot do it in humans, but you can do it in animal models. So at, uh, even if you are a clinician and you do clinical work, at some point of your career, you feel that you need more information and that you will need an animal model to answer some questions. And in this case, from some of the pathologies that we were looking, we had a lot of information from the scan, but we needed to know more things on the microscopic structure, so we start using animal models. And with this, you can take the heart, you can do normal microscopy, electronic microscopy. And we have been also working with the, micro, with the synchrotron, again with the team of, of BART, working with these, with these huge structures and get very super high resolution and, and to better understand the, the changes in the structure of these hearts. Then, of course, we have been also working on, on molecular pathways, and mainly that's in human, with human samples from blood or with placentas. You can, I think that in the previous talk, he was talking a lot about, a lot about omics. But uh, again, many times you see, okay, this baby has this problem. I see this problem in the, in, in the ultrasound and how the heart changes. Maybe I can do an animal model, understand the changes. Uh, also in the microscope, but then what is the molecular basis? Which are the mo molecular pathways driving that? Because then, this, if you understand these molecular pathways, many times the drugs or the treatment comes from that. And then uh, I, we have been working also on omics. I, I, this, I, I will not focus on that because my previous speaker has been working a lot, but that's a new area, eh? that when you don't have a clear hypothesis or you want to try to better understand, that's very trendy to do this multi-omics from, from genomics, epigenomics, proteomics, metabolomics. And these always get nice papers. Sometimes, once in a while, you get a real answer. Many times, it ends up with a nice paper with a lot of pathways that you don't fully understand. But sometimes, you can get really answers. And we have also been working on applying machine learning and artificial intelligence to better understand our data. That was a work that was done with a, a part trying to understand different phenotypes of babies that are born small um, and trying to merge clinical data, metabolomics data, and echoes and trying to identify, we identified two types of babies born small that have a different survival curve curve so that they behave very differently. And, and we have also been uh, applying, um, well, MKL, this is also work from Patricia Garcia that she was doing uh, with getting data from some echoes from a particular babies that have a tetralogy of a lot that is a particular problem of the heart and trying from the echo data, from the ultrasound data, trying to understand different phenotypes, and we could identify some phenotypes that behave clinically very differently. And some of them have very good outcome, and some of them have very bad outcome. So then you can come back and say to the clinicians, OK, you have to look at this particular feature in the ultrasound, because this will tell you how will be the outcome of this baby. So um, I have been trying to show a little bit um, how has been our approach to better study the fetal heart that, as I told you, it was mainly ultrasound but other things. And now I will try to talk a little bit about having these tools available, what have been studying, yeah? Which fetal diseases can affect heart development? And I like this scheme because um, most of the research that it's done is focusing on postnatal life. You have been seeing the talk about Manel Esteye that he has been talking about epigenetics, and he has been talking about postnatal life mainly. And he had just shown one slide with very small part of prenatal life. And this happens with most of the things in medicine. Yeah? So 99% of the medicine, it's focused on postnatal life. And we dedicate a lot of efforts on what we eat or what we do in postnatal life, but actually, development and disease and health, it, 
it has a, a, a lot of importance all the prenatal life. Why? Because when, you are, when we are a, an, an embryo, we are one single cell, and then from nine months, we get one single cell to one full baby. And for example, the heart and other organs are fully developed during these nine months. Of course, then they keep on maturing and doing growth and things, but these nine months of pregnancy are extremely critical on development. And if something goes wrong there, because things can go wrong in pregnancy, then your development is not good, it's not suboptimal, and then problems can arise later in life. And this prenatal period, it has been forbidden for many years, mainly because we didn't have the opportunity to check at this fetus. So it, it, like it didn't exist, really. And now, as I was telling you, this is a speciality that has emerged, and we know. So then, from all the factors can, that can influence fetal heart development or that can affect the development are many things that can go wrong in pregnancy, but we have been working many, t focusing in the placenta. The placenta is this particular organ that connects the mother and the fetus and gets the blood flow from the mother to give the food, the oxygen and nutrients to the fetus. So it's a very important organ. And very importantly, the placenta is an organ full of vessels like the heart, and it's directly connected to the fetal heart. So they, and they are developed at the same time. So at the same time, and very similar genes develop the, all the fetal vascular, cardiovascular system and the placenta vascular system. They are very close connectly and they develop together. So many times when you have an abnormal fetal heart, you will have an abnormal placenta, or if you have an abnormal placenta, you will have an abnormal fetal heart. So they are very, very well connected, as you will see. So I will show now a, a, a clinical case. That's the only clinical case I will show you. This is not nasty, eh? this is nice. So do not worry, I will not going to show nasty images. So this is a baby that the, the mother is sent to us. She is a mother that has no particular problems, that it's, it, the mother has a small belly, that's true. And then when we measure the baby, that we measure the head, the femur, the abdomen, we estimate the weight, the weight is small, it's the fifth centile, so it's smaller than it should be. With Doppler, we can check the blood flow through the uterine artery and umbilical artery, and it was reduced. That means that there is less blood flow going from the placenta to the fetus. And there is more blood flow going to the fetal brain. Then later we will see that. So we call it fetal growth restriction. So we have a fetus that is smaller than it should be, and it has signs that the placenta is not working well, because when we look at the blood flow through the placenta, it's not working well. If we look at the heart, the heart looks like this. So we have a, I mean, you can see it beating. And it's a heart that it's a little bit larger than it should be. It's a little bit hypertrophic. It has a little bit of pericardial effusion. And we can measure some cardiac parameters that I will explain later a little bit better that tells us that this, myo this heart has problems to work. It's not working pro perfectly, you know? It has, it dedicates more time to relax, so it has problems to relax. It's moving, the velocity of movements of this myocardium is reduced, and it has some post-systolic movements, and some weird deformation of the heart. So this heart, it's not good, very good, in a very good matter. So for many years, we have been studying babies with uh, placental problems and looking at the heart, and now I will try to summarize what, what we know from that. So this is a scheme of a fetus with a fetal heart, and you see here an image of a normal heart, how we see it in, 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 in a scan. Eh? So this is the right part of the heart, the left part, and you see four cavities, and they, it's a normal heart, this would be. But what happens when we have a placenta that is not well developed, for whatever reason? The placenta is not working well, it's insufficient, and it's more resistant. As I was saying, we can look at the blood flow of the uterine artery, that's the blood flow from the mother to the placenta, that it's abnormal. We can look at blood flow from the placenta to the fetus, that it's also abnormal, so that it's telling us, so we have the placenta from one side, from the other side, it has abnormal waveforms in Doppler, so that means that the placenta, it's, it's not working well. One thing that we see sometimes in these babies is that the fetal brain that it's a very important organ, 
and very like delicate says okay there is less oxygen and nutrients available because the placenta is sending us less oxygen and nutrients um, this cannot be the brain needs more oxygen and nutrients so let's take more blood so there is a vasodilation so the the brain vasodilates the vessels and takes more blood from the heart and this is the aortic isthmus that it's a part of the aorta that has a reverse flow that it's reflecting that the the brain vasodilates so much that takes some blood from the aorta back to the brain. So it's stealing blood from the rest because the brain says, okay, I'm the most important one, let's take more blood to the brain. And that's something that we see in these babies that are like in trouble. But what about the heart? The heart, apart from being an organ that receives less oxygen and nutrients as the brain, cannot do like the brain that says, okay, let's give me more blood and you manage, I don't know. No, the brain, is, the heart is really keeping the fetus alive and has to cope with the situation. So the heart feels that there is less oxygen and nutrients and also feels that there is more pressure because the, if we think about the fetal heart circulation, the fetal heart pumps blood against the aorta that goes down and gives the umbilical artery. That means that the heart receives the blood from the placenta, but then the fetal heart pumps against the placenta. So is the responsible to get this non-oxygenated blood from the fetus to the placenta back to the mother, but because then the mother can oxygenate it and bring it back. So the heart cannot say, okay, I'm doing nothing. No, no, the heart has to work more, pump harder, to make this blood go through the placenta. And then when we have this pressure overload that the heart needs to work more, the heart does, can do many things. One thing is to get more spherical, and that's one of the things that we see, that these uh, fetuses that problems in the placenta have a more spherical shape. You see that this is more elongated, this is more spherical. And, and that is reflecting that there is more pressure inside the organ. And this is already seen in mild cases of fetal restriction. And also um, in these hearts, for example, take more time to relax, have already problems in, in the, the relaxation of the myocardium. But what happens if this placental insufficiency is really severe, that it's, that's not enough, and it needs to pump even harder, that this change in the shape is not enough, and then the heart needs to hypertrophy and do more muscle to cope with the situation. So then we get this heart as I was showing you. It's a round heart that it's very like a ball, and then the, the muscle is very well seen because it has hypertrophy. And then with this, we also see even more changes of cardiac dysfunction, yeah? And this pattern of changes of the heart, that it gets more globular, and if it's more severe, it gets more hypertrophic, it took us years to understand, to see many cases, to understand what's going on, and, and many of the insights from the physiology help us to understand. It has been confirmed by other researchers in the world, and then, Apart from that, for example, I was telling you that we had this computational model of the fetal circulation. Part of the changes, we, we use the computational model to understand what's going on. And for example, this thing of the aortic isthmus that I was telling you that it's the brain is stealing blood from the heart and from the aorta and take it out to the brain. Thanks to the computational model, we could better understand that. And for example, move that. Okay, we also apply the computational model to understand that, for example, the computational model allows you to measure some things that you cannot measure in a human, like the resistance or the compliance. So we could see that these babies that have these placental problems have higher placental resistance, lower compliance. And then we also apply it to understand the changes on the lung vasculature of these babies, that they have also problems in the lung because there is more resistance. So really, when you have a clinical problem or a clinical scenario and you have questions or things that you cannot really answer, having the appropriate computational model and the, and the adequate question, you can get um, some answers to better understand. Mm. As I was telling you before, in humans you can do many things, but you cannot take the heart and look it in the microscope. And this is data from a rabbit animal model that we create the fetal growth restriction. 
and these are images from the synchrotron. Yeah, so we have a, a normal heart that's the coronary artery vessels, and and this is a case of a rabbit that was born with placental problems, and then we see that the vasculature of the coronary tree is different, mainly that it's less branches and it's like more dilated, and then by applying some statistics there on these reconstructions, we could demonstrate that they have like more dilated coronary arteries, which didn't make sense because if the heart feels that less oxygen nutrients available, the coronary treats develop to be to be like like wider, yeah, because the, the coronary arteries are trying to send more blood to the to the muscle. Also from this animal model, we have been trying to better understand the, the fiber distribution and it that's also post-processing from these synchrotron images. So these colors means the fiber distribution, and we were seeing that animals that were born with placental problems, the heart had more circumferential fibers and less longitudinal fibers. Yeah. So this has some consequences then later in life, and and try and help us to understand the changes that we also see in the in the in the ultrasound. If we go more to to the molecular pathway. Uh, in electronic microscopy, we saw that the sarcomere, so that's the contractile unit of the cardiomyocyte, was shorter. We could also apply confocal microscopy, and with um, that also was Patricia measuring the sarcomere length and seeing that it was shorter. So, um, as you have been seeing, we have been studying the fetal heart of these babies that have placental problems from the ultrasound, then to apply computational models to understand, then to and the animal models trying to understand what was the changes in the microscopy. And then we have been also studying what, what else. I mean, these are the, we have been demonstrating that these babies that have placental problems, the heart is developing in a different manner, functioning poorly, and have changes in the structure at organ and at molecular level. So what else? We have been doing some studies following these kids. So this was a study that had a lot of impact because it was the first study checking kids. It, this was a, these kids were five years of age, as I mean, at that time of the scan, uh, of the evaluation, and they were kids that had placental problems in utero. So we could, for the first time, demonstrate that these hearts of controls were more elongated, and again, the hearts of kids born small, were more round, and have these changes in, 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 the, in the tissue Doppler. We were following this cohort into pre-adolescents, and, and in this case, we, we saw the persistence of the changes. So we saw that this is a control that had an elongated heart. The IUGR had more globular heart. Here, we had like better quality ultrasound, let's say, and we decided to apply some, some machine learning or it was shape analysis of the ventricles, trying to better understand what was the difference between these ventricles. And we got that the size was different. So the heart of a small individuals were smaller in a, as a whole, but then they had like the apex was more pointing to, a, the, to the other side. And then also that were more spherical, yeah? So that was like a more smart way to show those changes. So of course you could tell me, okay, from your eye, you could see that this ventricle is more spherical than this ventricle. You don't need a machine to tell you that. But if you put numbers and you do more statistics, you can better illustrate that. But it, it was very nice to show it like this. Then uh, arriving at this point, we said, okay, it looks that when the placenta is abnormal, we have a lot of changes in fetal life that persist in infancy and in preadolescence. And this is a cohort of uh, individuals that we are following, and they are around 15 years old. But we wanted to get data from adults. So these changes, these problems that happen in utero, will have consequences in adult life. And because we didn't want it to wait, of course, we are going to follow this cohort, but we didn't want it to wait, we decided to create a cohort of adults that were born small, and we decided to do it um, in a new cohort. So we went to the delivery books 
of our institution. So we got like 500 individuals that were from 30 to 40 years of age. So we went to the delivery books in our institution. You know, when then there is a delivery, there is a book that the midwife just writes there, the name and the weight and everything, no? So we went to these delivery books 40 years ago. We were getting the surname of the mother and then trying to locate the patients in the Catalan system, calling them and say, okay, you were born in our hospital 40 years ago. Do you want to come to the hospital to do a check of your heart? We managed to get, after calling many people, we managed to get 500 adults that were apparently normal to come to our hospital. And we were offering them an echocardiography, a blood test, a, a cardiac MRI, an exercise test, okay? It was a big effort. It took us more than two years to get all, the, all these individuals to get there. And then finally, we analyzed the data of the echoes. And that was mainly the data of the echoes. That's an image, yeah? That's a control. And that's an adult that was born small. Yeah, if you look at it, it looks very similar. So actually, by doing many, many things, measuring many things, doing that machine learning that we were doing in the adolescence, we couldn't really see many things. That's true that many years had happened, 40 years, so we thought maybe it's not there anymore. We thought, okay, maybe some of them smoke, some of them eat very well, some of them eat, so other postnatal factors maybe they have affected. We said, okay, maybe there is no persistence of changes. But we had data from an exercise test. So we were seeing from the exercise test that in Basel, the performance of the individuals were very similar. But when, when, when we were do, asking them to go on a bike and do exercise, we realized that adults that were more small had less exercise capacity, 20% less exercise capacity. So actually, maybe the echo of the heart was similar, but the exercise, they had less exercise capacity. So we said, okay, let's, there must be something in this heart, yeah? So in this matter, we were lucky that we were doing some cardiac MRI to these individuals, and MRI has more resolution, and we were lucky that we collaborate very closely with BART, and then we had, uh, uh, that BART had a, a very good student that was Gabriel Bernardino that done this cardiac shape analysis. So we took this cardiac MRIs and we did like a reconstruction this with this cardiac MRIs and then we, you, we did this, this shape analysis. So this is a reconstruction of a cardiac MRI. So the image is a little bit different from the, from the echoes. So you did see the left ventricle that it's L, this one. And then you see the right ventricle that it's triangular. These are the two ventricles that we were seeing in the scan. So in blue, is the mean value of normal individuals, yeah? So now I will put a video and you will see that this blue will convert to, right, to red. The red one would be those individuals born small, well, with more changes, yeah? And I want you to look at this triangle here of the right ventricle. So if we start the video, you see that this right ventricle, that it was triangular, is starting to get like more round, yeah? So, by doing this cardiac MRI, all this reconstruction, all this post-processing and the cardiac shape analysis, we could demonstrate that that thing that apparently in the echo that was nothing, actually, when you look with cardiac MRI more accurate and you apply the proper analysis, actually in the right ventricle, this was a, a significant difference. Yeah, the, right, the left ventricle, it's true that was almost similar, but the right ventricle was more spherical. And we think that this partially explains, and it was actually there was a correlation, this poorer capacity of exercise, yeah? Because the right ventricle is the ventricle responsible to pump blood to the lungs, and you need a good circulation in the lungs to be able to do this exercise, yeah? So we think that all, all these problems that these adults, when they were 40 years before, when they were babies, they had a placental problem that changed the structure of the heart, mainly the right ventricle, this persisted postnatally, and give this more spherical shape of the right ventricle that then can partially explain that they had less exercise capacity. Yeah, and that's a clear example of why um, doing like multidisciplinary approach, doing the proper tests and applying the proper tools with a good team, 
you can get res a results that you can understand that on the other way around with the ultrasound, we, we didn't understand. We were not understanding things, eh? because we had this less fun this functional problem. Yeah, less exercise capacity that we couldn't explain with the echo. Um, with the same cohort, another thing that Gabriel did was to look at the influence of other factors. Yeah, so. Uh, because we thought, okay, these individuals that are adults, usually most of them are asymptomatic with no problems. But how, uh, we thought, okay, the changes in basal conditions are small changes in the right ventricle. But what could happen if we challenge this heart? Yeah, because we were seeing that when these individuals were challenged by an exercise test, they couldn't like manage. They had less exercise capacity. Another way of challenging the heart would be obesity, yeah? So if you are in a normal weight and you get obese, your heart has to come work more because you have more surface, yeah? So you, your heart needs to work more to pump more blood because you have more surface. So again, this is a, a reconstruction of a cardiac MRI. So in control, so in normal individuals, when you get obese, the normal thing is that your heart gets more muscle, more hypertrophic, are more dilated. And we could observe that in normal individuals. But when we were going to our adults that were born small, we couldn't hardly see changes. And actually, we saw that individuals that were adults, that were born small, and later were becoming obese, these are the ones who had poorer functional capacities and poorer exercise capacity. So that because they didn't have the opportunity to adapt. Yeah, we think that most likely when they were fetuses, they already, these hearts already had to adapt it to this placental insufficiency, so they already did that. So when they, when they get adults and if they had an extra hit, they are not able to cope with the situation and adapt to another insult. Okay, so the final part of the talk, I have been trying to show how, to, how all the things that we had to develop to properly study fetal heart, we have been focused mainly studying the placental insufficiency and the, how bad is having a bad placenta for your fetal heart development. But at some point we said, okay, let's try to do something because we are doctors. And it's good in a way to describe how bad is to have a bad placenta. But can we do something to treat and prevent that? I have to say that we have been doing some studies in, in animals, in, in animal research, and trying some drugs, hypertensive drugs, some drugs in the heart, and trying to improve the hearts of these, of these individuals. And it was a, a disaster, yeah? So actually, there is no treatment for this bad placenta. And when the placenta is bad, it has developed in a poor manner. The heart needs to adapt. And if you get drugs or try to improve, it gets even worse. So this was a complete failure. So, at this point, we said, OK, that was like six years ago, something like this. We said, OK, let's try to see which factors influence the fetal growth. So trying to find things. To treatment, we think it's difficult. But what about preventing? Yeah. So trying to avoid placental insufficiency. So if we try to avoid this, we, could, we should go to the beginning of the beginning. What was the factors that were explaining that the placenta is abnormal? And what happened is it is like in many things in medicine that it was multifactorial, yeah? So many things in medicine, you just not need one thing. Usually you need like several things to finally get up a disease. And then we identified many things. But we were trying to focus on modifiable things, yes? Because if you say, okay, if there is a genetic predisposition of having placental insufficiency, the genetics, it's hardly that we can improve. But what about modifiable things and for example nutrition yeah so we know that mothers in Africa with uh, a lot of problems that do not eat more properly have very small babies because they don't eat so the babies were small but we thought that this was not the case in Barcelona because usually in Barcelona people does not problems to get food but actually we saw that mothers that have small babies have had suboptimal nutrition so they think that they eat well and they eat quantity of food, but the pattern of food was not good. And doing metabolomic studies, we realized that actually the pattern of diet was poor in most of the mothers that had small babies. Another factor that we identified was a stress. So we are in a society that we are all stressed and we don't, all of us feel stressed. And actually pregnancy is a big stressful because a stress is mainly mediated by cortisol 
And cortisol activates when you have fear to something that you don't know. Yeah, so when you don't know, so you, you have a fire and you don't know if you are going to get alive or, you, or what will happen, then you get fear and then you get the cortisol up. In, a, in pregnancy, if you think, if it can seem a very happy period, but actually there is a lot of fears. When you are pregnant, you don't know if the baby will be born fine or not. You don't know if you are going to be a good mother. You don't know what will happen with your partner, if you are going to keep on being happy with your partner or not. You are not going to what will happen with your work, with your house, with everything. So it's a period of full of fears, and it has been demonstrated that the stress increases a lot, mainly at the brain of the pregnancy. And we realized that mothers from small babies had more stress, worse placenta, and this more stress in the mothers was reflected in higher levels of cortisol in the baby, in the amniotic fluid. Yeah. So at this point, we said, OK, let's try to do something. And we designed a trial trying to improve the diet of the mothers and trying to reduce the stress of the mothers. And then this is results from the IMPACT clinical trial. That was a clinical trial that was done in Barcelona. It took two years to randomize more than 1,000 pregnant women. These pregnant women were women that had some high risk factor to have a small babies. And they were randomly allocated to usual care, that means nothing special like usual care, or a program to improve the diet following a Mediterranean diet program with a nutritionist that was helping them to eat better, or a stress reduction that was uh, doing some mindfulness and yoga to reduce the stress of these pregnant women. The primary outcome was birth weight, low birth weight. Yeah? So we said, OK, by doing improving nutrition and reducing stress, we know that we are going to improve the mother. But we wanted to improve the growth of the baby to prevent the placental insufficiency. Yeah? So that was the primary outcome. That was the scheme of the trial. We randomized more than 1,000 pregnant women, 400 women in each group. And we could demonstrate that both interventions could reduce the prevalence of placental insufficiency or small babies. So the prevalence of a small babies was 22% in the usual care group. That was reduced to almost 13% in the Mediterranean diet and 14% in the mindfulness. And they were both statistically significant. And that was published in a high impact journal because this was the first demonstration that we could improve the fetal growth doing something, yeah? because all previous treatments had failed. I don't have data on the cardiac. We are working on it so to see if this has improved the cardiac. Well, I have data from, from the fetal brain MRI that we were doing, and that was done in collaboration with Miguel Angel. Um, and then we, with that, part of these babies were doing a fetal brain MRI, and we could see that both interventions not only were improving the fetal growth, but in particular, Mediterranean diet was improving the fetal brain total volume, and some of the volumes or areas of the brain that we are measuring were improved also by, by the interventions and also had functional consequences. So improvements in, in language or in, in, in some of the areas of the, of the neurological test. So this is my last slide, just as a summary of what I have been explaining. And we try to emphasize the importance of feature life that has been like forbidden for many years, for, forgiven for many years. And then we know that in fetal life we have a problem. It can have a, a, bad, outco a, 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 consequ a bad consequence in fetal heart development that can persist in infancy, in adolescence, in mature life. And it can predispose to later cardiovascular problems. Then it means that this population is more susceptible to disease. So it would be good to avoid bad things like tobacco or bad diet in these patients. But we really believe that it's ideal that if we can improve the lifestyle, the nutrition of the mother, or reduce the stress of the mother, then you can prevent this placental problem. And then, of course, you prevent the rest of the things. And that was everything. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very enthusiastic talk. Um, are there any questions? The microphone isn't working. Hello? No? 
No, there's people online also, so please wait for the microphone. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Um, I have just one quick question um, out of curiosity. Did you try to combine food and, and stress? Like this would be kind of a huge impact, might be, right? Yeah, that was a very good question. And actually when we're designing the trial, we had like this arm. So we had like usual care, Mediterranean diet, uh, stress reduction, and the combination of both. Or we were planning also, so to combine both, from the beginning, we didn't want it because then you don't know what it works. We had this fourth arm, but then when statisticians that had to do the statistical analysis of the trial, we showed to them, they said, no, no, that's too crazy because then the statistics get very complicated, so they consulted not to do it. So actually we thought that not, we were not expecting both to work. Yeah, we had some, I was more for the Mediterranean diet, my head was more for the mindfulness, so everybody had different <laughs> feelings on what would happen. Finally, both of them worked, most likely for different mechanisms, but we didn't expect that. So, of course, in the, in the future, let's hope that we have enough money to do a bigger trial and try both. We are not sure if it's going to work, eh? because sometimes in medicine, if you try to do too many things, then but, I mean, if you ask pregnant women to do too many things, sometimes it didn't work. I mean, it's too much, and then they didn't work. So we are trying to see how to figure out how to put it, because both of them were very demanding. The Mediterranean diet was meeting the nutritionist every two weeks, doing a lot of homework at home, cooking and things, and mindfulness was also very demanding. So if we join both like together, it will be too much. We are trying to see how to combine it in a doable manner. Yeah, but yeah, that's a very relevant question. Thank, Thank you. you. Other questions? Thank you, Fatima. So this was super impressive to see all, all the work uh, in, in one go, let's say. Um, so I have a question about the treatment, right? Because you, you said, um, yeah, prevention, prevention is, of course, super important. But you, you did some tests with animal models on, on different treatments. Um, but like you say, yeah, this is a period of life that has huge influence for later life, for ever. Um, but it's a lot of things are, I guess, still kind of unknown in a sense, right? And, and, and from the point of view of, of new treatments, new pharma or, or any type of treatment, uh, that there's a big potential there to explore, right? Um, do you think this is something that will eventually get the attention of people or farmers of, or, or it's, it's kind of something where people don't thread into because yeah. this is... No, no, of course. I am not saying that it's not going, nothing is going to work. It could happen. Eh? Mm -hmm. I, I'm saying that when we were trying like the typical cardiac drugs to improve the heart, it was not working. Yeah, because most likely when there is placental insufficiency, the fetal heart needs to do this adaptation to keep the baby alive. So actually when we were giving these cardiac drugs, babies were dying more. Yeah, because if you prevent the hypertrophy of the heart, then the heart do not compensate, then the baby dies. So it was getting worse. It, but it can happen that some drugs can be improved. Eh? It has been many things tried. Eh? It has been I, um, oxygen, sildenafil was very promising, and they did a trial, and they had to stop it because it was even going worse. And oxygen, eh, as I told, um, protein supplementation. So things have been tried, and it didn't work at this point. But of course, it can happen that in the future somebody finds something. Eh? It's true that pregnant women are usually um, excluded from most of the trials in the pharma. So that's something that pharmas do not particularly like. And there is a lot of controversy that women in general are excluded from trials and pregnant women are the typical exclusion criteria. So it's not it's something not easy, yeah, because it has a lot of consequences and to try a drug in a pregnant woman. It will not be easy, but of course, of ho hopefully no, some pharma get in that, or some researchers find something that could work. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, uh, Fatima, uh, for this nice talk. I have a couple of questions. Uh, the, the first one is, actually, you, you mentioned it a little bit, so uh, referring to uh, Manel's talk. 
So if we think about, you know, basic concepts of mechanobiology, so actually, so the heart tissue, cardiomyocytes, so everything should be able then to adapt, remodel, uh, both in, in healthy patients and then in those, uh, in those patients who had abnormal uh, placenta. So the fact that the function of remodeling is altered, so it, it directly points out so to definitive changes that the cell is working completely differently, uh, genetically speaking. So why haven't you looked at that? Uh, so is that very, is it, is it difficult to look at uh, so definitive uh, epigenetic changes that the cell would ah, have suffered? Or? Yeah, so you mean epigen if you had a look at the epigenetics? Yeah. We, we are doing a study with Manuel Estelle about epigenetics. Epigenetics, okay. he explained it very easily. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> it's not easy at all. So we tried in the past, it was a disaster, we couldn't get any result, and now we are doing a study with him, let's see if we can get something. Yeah, but most likely it's supposed, the theory says that all these changes are managed or the mechanism behind its epigenetic changes, because epigenetic is driven by environment, and if you have an hypoxic environment, less nutrient environment, most likely the epigenetics are changed in utero, and then most likely the epigenetics of these individuals are, are, are the, done. There are some studies eh, that have described some epigenetic changes, but it's not like easy. Right. Are, are there some organoids models or mm. animal? Well, I know animals are a bit less ethics, but organoids or animal models that would allow to yeah, check that a on very, a short time scale? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Animal models, there are many. So in, in fetal medicine, we work a lot with rabbit and lamb because for the size we can scan them and do ultrasound and we like to do ultrasound. Of course we have done works on, on, on rats and mice and, and there are models of placental insufficiency, different models that we could work with and for example I have seen showing some data about organoids um, actually, we, I was, we were planning to do a project, but we didn't get the funding, so let's hope that we can do it. We wanted to do organoids placental and heart and do aquaculture and then to study the interaction. That would be super nice. Yeah, so there is people doing cardiac organoids, there is people doing placental organoids, but the idea was to join it, but yeah. yeah I think it's very nice because if you can and develop the, the, uh, the experimental model, it's a very nice way then to start with computational counterpart and then use computational co counterpart to try to upscale then yeah, to uh, completely. Uh, full human scale. Yeah. So. yeah, I'm fully convinced that all different types of research are necessary. So clinical research is very important and observational research is important to understand what's going on. Then all this, this research on randomized trials are the final proof of if, to see if something works or not. Then all the computational models are very interesting to tune and do some questions that you cannot do in humans. Animal research is very important, molecular. It gives you a different point of view. And, and for example, in a period of time, I was doing a lot of animals. Then now I'm not doing animals anymore. I'm more on the clinical side. But I know that at some point I will need and I will come back to the animals or the, the organoids, the mechanics and, and the computational model in the heart. It has been always there. Right? But yeah, it's important that you as a researcher, not, you just not say, okay, I'm doing that and that's it. But you think, okay, to answer this question, what I do need? I, know, I need to go to the animal. I need to go to the cell. I need to go to the uh, find an engineer to do it or what? To, but to be like interdisciplinary. Yeah. So one of the things also with the epigenetics, one of the things that you have to keep in mind is that you look at very subtle disease in some ways. Huh? So that makes it very different with the previous speaker. Cancer is not very subtle, but what you're looking at is subtle but very prevalent because 10% of people were born small. Unfortunately, we don't have time. So the only thing I'm going to do is my last question. Again, the same question <laughs> as with the, with the previous speaker. Um, how? What type of engineers do you want to work with? What do we should focus on? Which type of biomedical engineers should be trained? And which are the ones that you want to collaborate with or hire in your lab? Yeah, yeah I think that, as, as Manuel Estere was saying, some engineer that it's open-minded or let's say that can, I can talk to and we can understand. Because it has happened before knowing Bart 
we had tried to work with engineers, but many times we didn't understood. So you talk, doctors talk a type of language, and then when engineers talk another type of language, and sometimes it's difficult to understand. So that both parts get used to it and can, a, a part of the language can be common and can really get that. So, so uh, doctors should study a little bit of mathematics, Mathem engineers should study a little bit of medicine, but it's mainly be open-minded to, to be able to communicate. And sometimes it requires time also. The first meeting you understand nothing, and after a few meetings you start to understand. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have to move on to the next speaker.